Good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. I'm Council Member Adrian Adams, the Chair of this Subcommittee. We are joined today by Council Member Koo, and we have other Council Members on their way. Today, we have a very big agenda. We are holding public hearings on 18 items. 21 items? 21 items, including how many landmark designations? Okay, I'm right. 18 <laughs> items, including 15 landmark designations, two HPD applications, and a school siting on which we also need to vote. Because we require a quorum to vote, we will begin with the school siting, the preconsidered LU for application number 20195068 STQ, submitted by the New York School Construction Authority pursuant to section 1732 of the New York School Construction Authority Act. This application concerns the proposed site selection for a new, approximately 3,079 seat high school facility to be located on block 1192, lots 41, 47, 48, and 54 in Council Member Van Bramer's district in Queens. We are joined today by SCA Reps Gail Mondaro and Kelly Murphy. Before you begin, Council will swear you in. Please raise your right hands and state your names. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee in response to all council member questions? Okay, thank you. You may begin. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, the New York City School Construction Authority has undertaken the site selection process for a new high school facility within the Woodside neighborhood in the borough of Queens and will serve students throughout Queens. I'm going to click on, thank you. I'll start with this. Uh, slideshow. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. Oops. So this is um, an aerial view of the of the site located at 5130 Northern Boulevard, where Northern Boulevard is the northern um, part of the site, um, the railroad um, tracks on the south. Um, to the east is uh, the Tower Shopping Center, and to the west, oh, excuse me, to the east is 54th Street, and to Tower Shopping Center is to the west. Um, the site contains approximately 3.15 acres or 136,895 square feet of lot area. And it's on block 1192 and contains lots 41, 47, 48, and 54. Under the proposed project, the SCA would construct a new approximately 3,079 seat high school facility. The notice of filing for the site plan was published in the New York Post on August 29, 2018, the city record on August 30th, 2018, and Queens Community Board number two, Community Education Council number 30, and the City Planning Commission were notified of the site plan on September 4th, 2018. The Citywide Council of High Schools was notified on September 6, 2018. And on September 12, 2018, the City Council on High Schools held a hearing on the site plan. On September 6, 2018, Queens Community Board number two held a public hearing, and they held a meeting on October 4, 2018, where they issued a letter of support of the site plan. Let's do the brother. Um, the site plan, uh, the SCA has considered all comments received on the proposal of the site plan and affirms the site plan pursuant to section 1731 of the Public Authorities Law in accordance with 1732 of the PAL. The SCA submitted the proposed site plan to the Mayor and City Council by letter dated August 30th, 2019. So um, this slide here is kind of a more zoomed in view of the, of the site itself and it's the entire where the dark building is to the corner. And then this is just some close-up photos um, of the site itself, um, which shows what's on the site is the former uh, Sports Authority building and a very large parking lot. Uh, the other photo is just kind of an alley that's between the adjacent um, shopping center next door, and that to the left is the existing building, which will be demolished. 
Um, this is just views of the parking lot and on the corner where the trees are, it's just to that other side is the um, subway line. And this is served by three subway lines and multiple bus lines. And just, just some overview of the project itself. It's uh, gonna serve over 3,000 students and there'll be three different school organizations including a district 75 and serving grades nine through 12. With that, we look forward to your subcommittee's favorable consideration of the proposed site plan, and if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just happy to see that we are aggressively pursuing high school um, high schools in, in the city, um, particularly in Queens, which we are so overburdened. Um, and this is so desperately needing, so um, I'm just really happy to see. This is very aggressive, over 3,000 seats for a high school, so I'm really happy to see this happen. Uh, we have been joined by Council Member Traeger, and uh, do my colleagues have any questions at this time? Council Member Koo? Thank you, Chair Adams, yeah. Uh, I have a question, is, uh, since this uh, location is really close to um, the highways, right? You know, the Northern Boulevard and then, the, and then the maybe the, which are the highways next to it? Is near, is near some? Northern Boulevard. More Northern Boulevard. Uh, Northern Boulevard and what, uh, what's the other ones? Uh, 50, 54th. 54th and 50th Street. Broadway, 54th and Northern Boulevard all come to the corner on the left in this picture. And then the subway station with three lines is right on the corner, which mm. we think is great for high school students. And I believe there's about seven bus lines that also serve this site. So this is, I'm worried about because it's close to like public transportation and the major highways. So I worry about the, the air quality uh, in the school, in the proposed school. So when you make build a school, make sure you have uh, some measures to uh, make sure the air quality in the building is, is, is good. As part and of when they, when they, what, do, do they, do they, when they do outside activities, uh, I'm not sure whether they, they be able to do it for a long time because it's near Northern Boulevard and there's a lot of uh, toxic uh, uh, stuff in the air, the PPMs. You know. So how do you prevent the, uh, the asthma uh, aggravations uh, uh, and other the health, um, health problems? No. So as part of all of our design we, uh, and due diligence, we do a complete air quality test and we put appropriate filtration systems in our HVAC systems for interior air quality. As far as outdoor play and things of that nature, we put them as far away on the site from the major thoroughfare. This building is not completely designed yet, so I couldn't inform you as to where it's going to be, but generally speaking, in our schools that are near major roadways, the play space is as far away as possible from the impact of the major roads. Okay, so you will take those into consideration when you design the school, right? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I see no questions from Council Member Traeger. And just for the record, Councilmember Van Bramer is in full support of this project. So that said, I thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Are there any members of the public wishing to testify on this particular item? Seeing none, the public hearing on this item is now closed. We do have our quorum. And uh, we call for a vote to approve the pre-considered LU related to application 2019-5068 SCQ. Council, please call the roll. Adams. Aye. Ku. Aye. Traeger. Aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and with zero abstentions, the item is recommended for, for referral to the full land use committee, and the vote is held open. Thank you, this vote will be held open. We will now move on to the public hearings for 15 historic landmark designations submitted by the Landmarks Preservation Commission pursuant to section 3020 of the New York City Charter and section 25-302 of the Administrative Code. Though these submissions are all individual landmark designations, we will hear them in three groupings. The LGBT history group, the Broadway group, and two landmarks unrelated to the other two groups. If you plan to testify on any of these items, please make sure 
to fill out an appearance slip for the sergeant at arms and to indicate the LU numbers on all of the items on which you plan to testify and whether you support or oppose the designations. The first group of six landmark designations we will hear are related to, you wanted to do Broadway things too? Okay. Are related to the history of the LGBT movement. Speaker Johnson championed the designation of these sites to coincide with New York City hosting World Pride and the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. They are LU 490, the historic landmark designation of the Gay Activist Alliance Firehouse, former engine company number 13, located at 99 Worcester Street, Block 501, Lot 30, and Council Member Chin's District in Manhattan. Three historic landmark designations in Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan, LU 491, the Cafe Chino located at 31 Cornelia Street, Block 590, P0 Lot 47, Lot 492, the Women's Liberation Center located at 243 West 20th Street, Block 770, Lot 17, and LU 493, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community Center located at 208 West 13th Street, AKA 206-218 West 13th Street, lot, Block 617, PO Lot 47. LU 494, the historic landmark designation of the James Baldwin residence located at 137 West 71st Street, Block 1143, Lot 19 in Council Member Rosenthal's district in Manhattan, and LU 495, the historic landmark designation of the Audrey Lord residence located at 207 St. Paul's Avenue, Block 516, Lot 32, and Council Member Rose's district in Staten Island. I now open the public hearing hearings on these items. And I want to extend my congratulations to the speaker on his work to protect these historic sites and now recognize him. We will not recognize and we will mention that he is in support of these <laughs> designations. Okay, we're now joined by our LPC reps. Anthony Fabre and Kate lemus McHale. You can tell I've had too much coffee today. Please raise your right hands and please state your names. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all uh, council member questions? Okay, good afternoon to you both. You may begin.
oh, sorry, is that better? <laughs> Between Spring and Prince Streets, uh, in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District, the GAA organized in the year following the Stonewall Riots and was most active in 1971 to 74 when this building served as its headquarters. Designed by the prolific fire department architect Napoleon de Brun, Le Brun in 1881 to 82, the building features painted cast iron, red brick with stone trim, and terracotta details. The interiors were partly destroyed by arson in October 1974, but the exterior is intact to its historic appearance and to the period of association with the GAA. At the, uh, the owner opposed the individual landmark designation. All of these had the same support that I summarized earlier. The building derives its significance as an important agent of change and inspiring the creation of like organizations throughout the United States. In addition to hosting alliance meetings, dance parties, and cultural events serving LGBT communities, the GAA produced a weekly cable news program during this period and published Gay Activist, a monthly newsletter. The New York City chapter lobbied for passage of LGBT civil rights legislation through sit-ins and picket lines. It also planned what it called ZAPs to confront politicians and celebrities about their positions on LGBT issues and to gain media attention. Many important LGBT groups were founded in the former firehouse or used space in the building, such as Lesbian Feminist Liberation, Gay Youth, the Gay Men's Health Center, and the Catholic group Dignity. The Women's Liberation Center is culturally significant as an important gathering place for a collective force of women-led groups, committees, and organizations pushing for radical political action serving all women. Located on the north side of West 20th Street between 7th and 8th Avenues in the Chelsea neighborhood, the city-owned 19th century firehouse was the epicenter for women's engagement in the LGBT mo rights movement from 1972 to 1987. The property was designed by Charles E. Hartshorn in 1866, as Chelsea developed as a middle-class residential neighborhood. The building features detailing such as arched window lintels, a bracketed cornice, and a decorative cast iron frame surrounding the vehicular entrance. 243 West 20th Street housed Hook and Ladder Company Number 12 from 1866 to 1967. The building derives its cultural significance as a volunteer-run collective that housed some of the most influential organizations working to bring public attention to the discrimination and legal injustices faced by le lesbians and all women, including the Lesbian Feminist Liberation, which was a lesbian rights group founded in 1972. The group protested bigoted media representations of lesbians, fought to raise visibility for women at LGBT political rallies and pride marches, and advocated in particular for lesbian mothers who often encountered difficult child custody battles after divorce. Other groups that used the building included the Lesbian Switchboard, the Lesbian Life Space Project, the Radical Feminists, the Anti-Rape Group, and Older Women's Liberation. <coughs> after the Women's Liberation Center disbanded in the mid-1980s, several of the lesbian organizations there, including the Lesbian Switchboard, moved to the new LGBT Community Center on West 13th Street, which I'll describe in the next uh, presentation. 243 West 20th Street has continued to serve New York City women. Since the late 1980s, it served as the home of non-traditional employment for women, a skilled trades workforce development program. The Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Community Center is culturally significant for its key role in the growth and development of LGBT rights in New York City for the past 35 years. As a safe space for advocacy and community groups to meet and grow their organization, this significance continues today. The center is located on the south side of West 13th Street, mid-block between 7th and Greenwich Avenues in the Greenwich Village Historic District. The central portion of the building was built circa 1869 with side additions constructed in the late 1870s. Used in the 19th and early 20th century for educational purposes, the three-story Italianate-style structure was purchased from the city of New York by the LGBT Community Center in 1983 and has been its home ever since. It derives its significance as the home of the LGBT Community Center, founded in 1983 as the LGBT Community Services Center, to provide both men and women with a safe space to meet and share ideas. By 1985, six tenant organizations were leasing space 
and hundreds of people a week were crowding into the center's rooms. The efforts of the many groups and organizations housed at the center led to the eventual passage of a city council bill banning discrimination based on sexual orientation that became law in 1986. Since its founding, the center has promoted the health and wellness of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community, including the fight against AIDS and HIV. After the disbanding of the GAA and the Women's Liberation Center, the opening of the center filled a growing need for gathering space and for a supportive and accepting environment as the HIV AIDS epidemic was having a profound impact on its communities. The center partnered with a variety of groups in an effort to educate the broader public about LGBT health issues, such as one partnership that included contributing 1,200 panels to the AIDS memorial quilt with the organization Heritage of Pride. The center continues to provide services, act as a gathering place, empowering and building a stronger LGBT community in New York City. Today, the center is home to an archival collection, arts and culture programming, young adult programs, and career services dedicated to the LGBT community. The center has played an active role in promoting marriage equality, health and wellness programs, and continues to participate in Pride Week with a float and an annual garden party fundraiser. And at our public hearing, the um, representatives of the center did support the designation and just voiced some concerns about uh, regulation, which we've spoken with them about. The James Baldwin Residence is culturally significant for its association with James Baldwin and his significant contributions to literary and civil rights history through his writing and activism. In 1965, celebrated novelist, essayist, and civil rights activist James Baldwin purchased this apartment house on Manhattan's Upper West Side, which served as his New York residence from 1966 to 1987. It's located on the north side of 71st Street in the Upper West Side Central Park West Historic District. Uh, at the public hearing, the property owner opposed designation of the building as an individual landmark. Council member Helen Rosenthal publicly supported the designation. Uh, James Baldwin was born in Harlem in 1924, educated in New York City's public schools, and gained notice as a book reviewer before moving to Paris in 1948. While in Europe, he completed his canonical semi-autobiographical novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, in 1952. Baldwin's fiction was groundbreaking for its depictions of bisexual and same-sex relationships in works including Giovanni's Room and Just Above My Head, which was published in 1979 during his association with the residents. During his time at 137 West 71st Street, Baldwin also participated in several notable New York City events, including an appearance with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at Carnegie Hall weeks before King's assassination in 1968, and a 1982 meeting of the New York chapter of the group Black and White Men Together, in which he spoke publicly for the first time about his experience as a gay African-American man. The photos on the left are of Baldwin in the rear yard of this uh, property, which were taken by the New York Times. The house was constructed in 1890 as a, one of a group of four row houses. In 1961, four years before Baldwin purchased the building, um, architect H. Ronald Kenyon, Russell Kenyon, extensively altered it with a new modern white brick facade that was brought even with the facades of its neighbors. It retains good integrity to the period associated with James Baldwin from 1966 to 1987. And though he primarily lived in France, he considered himself a transatlantic com commuter, maintaining a New York City apartment from the 1950s on. During his time in this residence, he worked on plays, screenplays, and novels, and corresponded with other prominent literary and cultural figures. He owned the building with his family. His mother and two sisters also lived in the building, and this was something that was very important to him. Major writers and musicians, including Toni Morrison, who also briefly lived in one of the apartments, Amari Bakara, Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, and Max Roche visited the Baldwins here and were considered members of their extended family. Until he died in 1987, 137 West 71st Street was Baldwin's New York home, and there is no other property within the city that bears this strong an association with Baldwin and his work. 
And finally, the Aldry Lord residence is culturally significant as the primary residence of the renowned African-American writer and activist from 1972 until 1987, a time in which she produced some of her most famous works. The property is located on St. Paul's Avenue in the St. Paul's Avenue Stapleton Heights Historic District and was designed in a neo-colonial style by the prominent Staten Island builder Otto P. Luffler in, 19, in 1898. Audrey Geraldine Lord was born in 1934 to Caribbean immigrants in New York City, where she attended Hunter College and Columbia University. She worked as a public school librarian for several years before finding success as a writer. Audrey Lord and her partner Francis Clayton purchased 207 St. Paul's Avenue in June 1972. During her family's time here, Lord survived breast cancer and produced some of her most famous works. In 1973, her third volume of poetry, From a Land Where Other People Live, was nominated for a National Book Award, and over the next several years, she published important poetry collections, essays, and novels, some of which are shown here. Through the 1970s and 80s, Lord was a prominent political activist in a number of arenas, including African American civil rights, feminism, and the gay and lesbian movement. In 19 uh, 83, Lord spoke at the 20th anniversary of the National March on Washington, speaking for lesbian and gay rights. And in 1980, she had co-founded Kitchen Table, Women of Color Press, which was dedicated to producing work by and about women of color of all racial, ethnic heritages, national oranges, origins, ages, socioeconomic classes, and sexual orientations. For her contributions to literature and activism in 1991, Lord was appointed as the Poet Laureate for New York State, a position she held until her death in 1992. As noted in a 2019 New York Times article, Lord's work is still very resonant today, and in particular as women in the LGBT community uh, continue to fight for equality. So with that, I will thank you, and I'm happy to take any of your questions. Well, I just want to say that uh, this is an impressive package um, and extremely important to the LGBT community. So I just wanted to um, commend you for your work um, at LPC. This is something that is unprecedented in the world of landmarks for the city of New York. So I thank you for making history uh, for the city of New York and preserving these amazing properties so that they will live on in perpetuity <coughs> for this community that has been overlooked for so long. So I thank you for that. You. I don't have any questions. Councilmember Ku? No. Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Are there any members of the public wishing to testify? I see Simeon Bankoff. Ken Lustbado. And Sarah Bean. Atman. You may begin when you're ready. Oh. Thank you. Um, good, good afternoon, my name is Ken Lustbader and I'm the co-founder and co-director of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project. The overall project goal is to make an invisible history visible since many LGBT place-based historic sites remain unknown and unappreciated. On behalf of both the project and myself, I strongly support the designation of the six sites being considered as individual New York City landmarks. For over 25 years, along with my project co-directors, I have been involved in the issues related to LGBT history, documentation, and historic preservation. Beyond the already recognized Stonewall, the project is identifying hundreds of existing sites from the 17th century through 2000 that illustrate the richness of the city's LGBT history and the community's contributions to American culture. When we started the project, no survey or comprehensive documentation previously existed of sites associated with the LGBT history and culture of New York City. This deficit had prevented effective advocacy, educational opportunities, leaving potentially significant sites and histories unappreciated, uncelebrated, and potentially endangered. 
I want to thank the Land Use Committee, the Landmarks Preservation Commission Chair, commissioners, and staff for considering the six sites for designation. Earlier this year, the project submitted to the Commission a list of prioritized sites for possible designation that included these six locations. Those recommendations came from our recently published Historic Context Statement for LGBT History in New York City, which surveys by nine themes the city's rich LGBT's place, LGBT place-based history. The report helped contextualize LGBT history tied to specific sites in the city. The city's actions in officially recognizing and memorializing sites associated with LGBT history and culture sends a strong message beyond the physical preservation of buildings and spaces. It's a, continu a continuation of the activism started by earlier advocates from Henry Gerber in the 1920s to the Mattachine Society and Daughters of Belitis in the 1950s to those individuals such as Craig Rodwell, Carla J., Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, and countless, countless others who fought against discrimination and for liberation in the 1970s. With the recent pushback against LGBT rights, the histories embedded in place-based heritage can help inform how personal and political decisions are made. The city's official designation of these sites has the power to provide both a tangible, visceral connection to what is an often an unknown and invisible past, and the tangible benefits of pride, memory, identity, community, and continuity. Designation will help recognize that LGBT history is American history and reduce shame and isolation for future generations of individuals coming to terms with their identity with the benefit of learning about their LGBT past. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Sarah Bean Atman. I'm the Director of Research and Preservation for Village Preservation. I'm here to express our support for the designation of Cafe Chino at 31 Cornelia Street the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Center at 208 West 13th Street, and the Gay Activist Alliance Firehouse at 99 Worcester Street as individual landmarks. In 2006, Village Preservation proposed Cafe Chino for landmark designation as part of the Village South Village Historic District, noting its critical LGBT and theatrical history. In 2010, the Landmarks Preservation Commission designated the first phase of that proposed historic district, including 31 Cor Cornelia Street, as a significant building and noting its LGBT and theater history in the designation report. <coughs> Nevertheless, we are happy to see that history further recognized with individual landmark status and support the proposed designation. Cafe Chino is universally recognized as the birthplace of the off-off-Broadway theater movement, as well as for the critical role it played in nurturing experimental theater and in providing a forum for openly gay playwrights and actors to share material related to gay and lesbian identity when few other opportunities existed. Because of this extraordinary level of openness provided by the cafe operator, Joe Chino, himself a gay man, the cafe became a hub of creative innovation and accessibility, freeing playwrights and actors from the constraints normally associated with conventional theater, even off-Broadway. In 2014, Village Preservation proposed the LGBT Center and the Gay Activists Alliance Firehouse, along with the Stonewall Inn and Julius's Bar for landmark designation, addressing the lack of recognition of the important LGBT history of these sites in their historic district designation reports, which in all cases contain no mention of this incredibly important aspect of the building's history. The center is eminently worthy of, of landmark designation. For three and a half decades, it has been a center of community and political organizing and the provision of much needed social services, a communal meeting place, a public forum, and a keeper of culture. The center has played a key role in recognizing and serving the needs of LGBT youth, seniors, families, religious communities, and people with disabilities, victims of hate crimes, people with AIDS, and writers, artists, and performers. It was the scene of early organi organizing to secure civil rights legislation, access to health care, and inclusive curricula in city schools. The GAA Firehouse also more than merits landmark designation. The Gay Activist Alliance was the, one of the most influential post-Stonewall LGBT groups, pioneering ZAPs against political opponents while also promoting the earliest gay civil rights legislation in the country. Their presence at the Firehouse at 99 Worcester Street was particularly consequential as they turned the building into a de facto LGBT community center when no such an entity formally existed. Their reuse of the abandoned city-owned structure also spoke to the growing movement transforming Lower Manhattan at that time, where disused structures were re reimagined for new and unconventional purposes, heralding a period of unrivaled political and social creativity and ferment in this area in the mid to late 20th century. 
Prior to 2015, there was not a single individually landmark building in New York City based primarily upon LGBT, LGBT history. In fact, while there has been significant progress on that account in the designation of historic districts, until these recent designations, the Stonewall Inn remained New York City's sole individual LGBT historic landmark. We are happy to see that change. These three sites all merit individual landmark status due to their significant contributions to LGBT history, and we therefore urge the subcommittee and the city council to approve their designations. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Councilmember uh, Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council, HTC, is in very strong support of all of these items. Um, we would like to commend the Landmarks Preservation Commission and the Council for being such strong advocates for that. These are truly breakwater um, sites and designations in the sense that they are adding to our common history, adding to our shared history. Although five out of six of these sites were already regulated by the LPC, there are elements in each of them that were lost and would not be known without these designations. Additionally, um, I'd like to say that the, we're particularly proud of the, the Baldwin House because that's a case which it, that history could easily be erased by the proper preservation issue, uh, proper preservation practice to restore it back to an earlier time. Instead, through this designation, we're actually capturing the importance of Mr. Baldwin. Um, I'm gonna conclude by saying it's a very strange thing to see one's personal history actually become official history, that um, when I used to hang out at the LGBT center with my friends, um, we were young and we thought it had been there forever and you know, I was surprised to discover it actually had only been there for like three years. And now to have it become a landmark is a remarkable thing. It's uh, a remarkable thing to see the, uh, the Women's Liberation Center where my mom used to volunteer at the Lesbian Switchboard back in 1981 uh, become a landmark. And these were all places which helped service a community that was criminalized in the very recent past. As the commission continues to expand its reach and its breadth, we hope that they continue to recognize, honor, and protect places of uh, formerly marginalized communities. It's, it's tough, but it's very important, and it's a very important thing to share for all of us to move forward. Thank you. I thank you all um, for your testimony today. I agree a thousand percent with everything that the three of you have said today. I thank you so very much. In particular, um, the uh, Baldwin House designation. Um, I believe that one of my sheroes, she wasn't mentioned, Kate, but I believe that one of my sheroes also frequented that, and that was Maya Angelo. I believe that she, she also frequented uh, the Baldwin residence as well, and um, I'm very, very uh, excited, as I know that you are, to be a part of this history as well, and I thank you again for your testimony. Thank you. We've been joined by Councilmember Inez Barron. If there are no more members of the public wishing to testify on that item, we will close the public hearing on LUs 490, 491, 492, 493, 494, and 495. We will now move on to a group of seven landmark designations submitted by the Landmarks Preservation Commission pursuant to Section 3020 of the New York City Charter and Section 25-302 of the Administrative Code, all of which are located on Broadway and Councilmember Rivera's district in Manhattan. LU 481, the 817 Broadway Building, AKA 817-819 uh, Broadway, 48 through 54 East 12th Street, Block 563, Lot 31. LU 482, the 826 Broadway Building, now the Strand Building, AKA 826 through 828 Broadway, 57 through 63 East 12th Street, Block 564, Lot 34. LU 483, the 830 Broadway Building, Block 564, PO Lot 36. LU 484, the 832-834 building, Broadway building, block 564, PO lot 36. LU 485, the 836 Broadway building located at 836 through 838 Broadway, AKA 72 through 74 East 13th Street, block 564, lot 39. LU 486, the 
840 Broadway building. Located at 840 Broadway, AKA 64 through 70 East 13th Street, Block 564, Lot 41, and LU 487. The Roosevelt Building, located at 841 Broadway, AKA 837 Broadway, 837 through 847 Broadway, 53 through 63 East 13th Street, Block 565, PO Lot 15. I hereby open the public hearings on LUs 481, 482, 483, 484, 485, 486, and 487. And we'll let everyone know that Council Member Rivera is in support of these designations. I now once again recognize LPC representatives to present their testimony on these designations. I call again Kate Lemus McHale and Anthony Fabre. And before you begin, I ask you once again to restate your names for the record and remind you that you are still under oath. Uh, thank you, Chair Adams. I'm Kate Lemus McHale, the Landmarks Commission. I'm Anthony Fabre with LPC as well. Thank you, you may begin. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present these seven individual landmarks that were designated by LPC on June 11th. Um, New York City's landmarks represent the city's cultural, social, economic, political, and architectural history, and their protection promotes understanding and pride in our history and heritage, along with bringing recognition, promoting tourism, and other benefits. And LPC identifies potential landmarks through detailed survey, evaluation, and research in response to requests from the public and based on agency initiatives and priorities. We do extensive outreach with property owners and are happy and willing to meet with them as many times as is needed or desired with the goal of gaining their support for designation and understanding of our regulatory process. Designation does not compel owners to, for, to perform work on their property, nor does it freeze the appearance of a building in time. The landmarks law recognizes that buildings may need to be changed and altered to remain functional, relevant, and productive. The LPC has an extensive body of rules and reviews and approves restoration, maintenance, and appropriate changes to landmarks proposed by their owners. And approximately 95% of applications for work on landmarks are approved at the staff level. I'd like to provide you with a summary of our study of this area and the developmental history and significance of this group of individual landmarks and then very short presentations on each building. The area south of Union Square was an exclusive residential neighbor neighborhood in the 1830s and 40s, its growing population housed in row houses and mansions. Following the Civil War, Broadway became an important commercial corridor, attracting hotels, theaters, and stores. These photos show the evolution of the neighborhood by the turn of the 20th century when, with the construction of the subway through Union Square and technological innovations allowing taller structures with steel framing, electricity, and elevators, the area was transformed by the construction of new, tall store and loft buildings. The seven landmarks presented here today are outlined in red on this map. Um, they were the result of a comprehensive survey and evaluation of the area south of Union Square between Fifth and Third Ad Avenues carried out last summer in response to community concerns about development in the area, uh, which was supported by Council Member Rivera. LPC devoted substantial resources to the building by building study. Our survey and analysis found that the area contains a variety of residential, manufacturing, and commercial structures erected in the 19th and early 20th century, interspersed with many altered and new buildings built within the past 30 years. Because of this variety of age, type, architectural quality, and integrity, we did not find a historic district merited consideration in this area. However, our study underscored the outstanding significance of Broadway to the historical development and architectural character of the area, and we identified the most architecturally distinctive and intact buildings along this section of Broadway for designation as individual landmarks. The seven landmarks shown here in historic photographs were designed by notable New York City architects. One was built in 1876 with neo grec style cast iron facades, the rest were constructed between 1895 and 1902 and designed in the Renaissance Revival style with facades clad in stone, brick, and terracotta in a light colored palette, incorporating elaborate, classically inspired ornamentation. 
They were commissioned by speculative developers and primarily housed garment industry showrooms and factory space. The garment industry was a major employer of New York City's working class and immigrant women and became an important sphere through which their advocacy for labor rights and suffrage emerged. Many of these buildings were picketed during labor strikes that furthered goals of the labor movement. The remarkably intact buildings anchor prominent corners and form an entire block front of the section of Broadway between NoHo and Union Square and reflect the late 19th century development of the avenue and broader area. They're architecturally significant examples of their style and type and culturally significant for their associations with the garment industry and labor history, as well as filmmaking and book publishing and selling. LPC believes the designation of these meritorious buildings as a cluster recognizes and protects the significant historic character remaining along this important corridor. 817 Broadway is a handsome and finely detailed example of the Renaissance Revival style designed by George B. Post in 1895 on a prominent corner site, and its significant design retains a high degree of integrity. It's located at the southwest corner of Broadway and East 12th Street. At the December 4th uh, public hearing, 14 people spoke in support of the designation of 817 Broadway and the entire group, and I'm just going to summarize it once now and not and let you know any additional testimony we received for the uh, specific properties. Uh, support included uh, representatives of Historic Districts Council, New York Landmarks Conservancy, Society for the Architecture of the City, Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, and East Village Community Coalition. The commission also received seven pieces of correspondence in support of designation of the whole group, including from council member Carlina Rivera, New York State Senators Brad Hoyleman and Liz Kruger, New York State Assembly Member Deborah Glick, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, the Municipal Art Society of New York, and the, Municipal, and the New York Metropolitan Chapter of the Victorian Society in America. We received one email opposing the designation of all seven buildings. 817 Broadway is currently undergoing a sensitive restoration of its brick and terracotta clad facades and the owner spoke at the public hearing to describe this work and state that, he look, that they look forward to working with the commission. The building was an early tall commercial building in the neighborhood and remains prominent in the streetscape. Its architect, George B. Post, was one of New York's best known and influential late 19th century architects. The highly visible street facades are embellished with tan colored Roman brick and terracotta reliefs inspired by Italian Renaissance architecture. Standout features include its distinctive angled piers and elaborate crown with a pierced parapet. Post designed 817 Broadway as the Meyer Jonathan and Company building, a firm advertised as the world's largest manufacturer of ladies' garments. 817 Broadway continued to serve the garment industry in the early 20th century. Uh, across Broadway, 826 Broadway is significant architecturally as a distinguished commercial expression in the Renaissance Revival style built in New York at the turn of the 20th century. It's also culturally significant as the home of the Strand Bookstore since 1956 and for its historical association with the garment industry. The 11-story store and loft building was built in 1902 on the northeast corner of Broadway and East 12th Street. At its first public hearing uh, on December 4th, the following written submissions, in addition to the support I already described, 12 people spoke in opposition um, to the proposed designation, including the building's owner, and the commission received three written submissions in opposition to designation. At the owner's request, LPC held a second public hearing uh, on this property on February 19th, 2019. At that time, seven people testified in favor of the proposed designation, including C Council Member Carlina Rivera, representatives of the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, the Historic Districts Council, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, and the Victorian Society of New York. Fourteen people testified in opposition, including the owner. The commission subsequently received 53 written submissions in support of the designation, including from representatives of, the, of eight historic preservation advocacy groups, and received a letter from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The commission received 76 written submissions opposing the proposed designation, and a petition to, quote, save the strand was shared with the commission when it had approximately 6,600 signatures. <laughs> 826 Broadway was developed in 1902 for garment industry tenants seeking larger manufacturing and hotel 
wholesale spaces. Its architect, William H. Brookmeyer, was a prolific designer of steel frame structures in New York City and a well-known expert on the engineering aspects of design, writing several publications that were important references in the field. 826 Broadway is an intact and especially robust example of the Renaissance revival with uh, identical decorative features on both facades, lending prominence to both. In 1956, the Strand Bookstore moved from its previous location on East 9th Street near 4th Avenue's Book Row to the ground floor of 826 Broadway. Located there for over 60 years, the Strand is the building's longest occupant, eventually expanding to three floors of retail space with an inventory of more than 2.5 million books and purchasing the building in 1996. The Strand became a center of literary life in Lower Manhattan, as well as internationally recognized destination for New Yorkers and visitors alike. The building serves as an important reminder of the neighborhood's historic role as the center of the book trade in New York City. The 830 Broadway building is another remarkably intact example of the tall store and loft buildings introduced in the late 19th century around Union Square to house garment related businesses and has exuberant facade decoration. It is located mid-block adjacent to the Strand. At its public hearing on December 4th and in subsequent correspondence, the building received the same support for designation as I previously described. Built by the Mella Fireproof Partition Company in 1898, 830 Broadway, seen here with 832 Broadway on the left and the Strand Building on the right, originally housed garment manufacturers and wholesalers and later a variety of tenants including publishing firms in the 1940s and 50s. It was converted to work, live workspace by artists and musicians in the 70s and became a residential co-op with 832 Broadway in 1980. It was designed by Cleverton and Putzel, known for their use of finely crafted ornamentation and features elaborate ornamental detail, in particular at its base and its two-story crown shown here and retains a high degree of integrity to its original design. 832 to 834 Broadway is a distinguished and intact Renaissance revival style store and loft building built in 1897. The designation recognized both its architectural and its cultural significance related to the turn of the century commercial transformation of this part of Broadway and connections to labor history and political activism. Uh, it is located mid-block, as you can see here in the map, um, and received the same uh, support as I described earlier. 832 Broadway was developed by the Commercial Realty Improvement Company in 1897 and designed by Ralph Townsend, a noted architect of the era, whose work in New York City has been recognized by the commission and includes a variety of building types and styles. Its entire facade is encrusted with decorative, classically inspired ornament as seen in these detailed photographs. 832 Broadway was originally home to cloak makers and in 1898, it was the location of an agreement made during the cloak maker strike, sending 500 workers back to work. A variety of garment manufacturers occupied the building through the 1930s, when the Workers' Party of America, later the Communist Party of the USA, established a publishing company in the building and published many um, Communist Party pamphlets and printed propaganda, such as shown here. 836 Broadway Building is a cast iron store and loft building designed by Stephen Decatur Hatch in 1876. It's the oldest building among this group and its two facades on Broadway and East 13th Street are architecturally significant examples of the neo grec style popular after the Civil War. It occupies an irregularly shaped lot shown here at the December 4th public hearing and in subsequent written correspondence we received the same uh, support for designation. The building was constructed by the estate of James and Cornelia Roosevelt, who were the great uncle and aunt of President Theodore Roosevelt, uh, on the site of their house. The first long-term tenant was Mitchell Vance and Company, important ma manufacturers of ornamental metal, clocks, and electric lighting fixtures. The architect, Stephen Decatur Hatch, uh, designed this building as well as the Roosevelt Building, which we'll see in a minute. And he was an important 19th century architect. He was an architect of the US War Department and known for several New York City landmarks such as the Gilsey Hotel and the original portion of the New York Life Insurance Building on Broadway. 
Hatch's design for 1836 Broadway exhibits a clearly defined hierarchy and generously sized windows. Particularly notable are the delicately incised and applied ornament and Renaissance-inspired surrounds at the mansard roof. The Roosevelt Estate sold 836 Broadway in 1921, and it continues to function as a commercial building today with an antique business on the first two floors and offices above. The 840 Broadway building, located on a prominent corner and completing this block front, is another architecturally significant and well-preserved example of the transformation of this area at the turn of the century. It's located at the southeast corner of 13th Street and Broadway. Um, and it received the same support already described at the public hearing. Three representatives of the owner also spoke, um, noting their appreciation for the honor of designation and posing a number of questions about how work on the building would be regulated. The 12-story building was designed by Robert Meineke, a notable designer of commercial buildings in New York City. It was built between 1899 and 1901 and can be seen in these historic photographs. Like its neighbors on the block, 840 Broadway housed mainly garment manufacturers and wholesalers. The Goodyear Waterproof Company, who sold raincoats and rubber apparel, occupied the ground floor in the 1940s and 50s. It was converted to mixed-use cooperative in the 1970s and today is primarily residential above the retail ground floor. The impressive Renaissance Revival style building retains a high degree of integrity with intact limestone, brick, and terracotta facades and beautiful historic storefronts with curved glass and decorative metalwork. And finally, the Roosevelt Building is an exquisite element of Broadway streetscape and an outstanding example of the late 19th century commercial development south of Union Square. Built between 1893 and 1894, it is also historically significant for housing one of the first American film studios, the Biograph Company, which advanced filmmaking technology. Uh, at its public hearing and in subsequent uh, correspondence, this pr proposed, this designation received similar pr uh, support and the owner also expressed support for designation and described the plan restoration of the base of the building. It's prominently situated on the northwest corner of Broadway and East 13th Street, and the um, landmark site is a lot in part consisting of just this building. Uh, Stephen Decatur Hatch designed the building with striking facades that include elaborate terracotta ornamentation with evocative faces, beasts, sea creatures, and foliage. Clothing manufacturers were the Roosevelt Building's primary tenants, including the Hackett, Carhartt, and Company, whose signage is evident in these historic images. And the American Mutoscope and Biograph Company, later just the Biograph Company, was also a tenant from 1896 to circa 1906. The company pioneered the Mutis Mutoscope in 1894, which was a film viewing device. Um, and later the Biograph Projector, which defined a new era of filmmaking and viewing. Their first film studio was located on the roof of the Roosevelt Building, captured in the still on the left from their 1906 film, The Skyscrapers of New York. And that is it for the Broadway buildings, and I welcome any questions. I don't have any questions on these applications, Councilman Farron. Okay, thank you for your testimony on thank this. Thank you very much. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on these particular items? Seeing none. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm going to call you back. I see some. <laughs> Simeon, come back. Sarah, come back. <laughs> and Andrea, come back. Oh, come up. You may begin when you're ready. Okay. <laughs> Hello again, Sarah Bean Atman, Director of Research and Preservation for Village Preservation. Village Preservation has long called for action prote to protect the precious and vulnerable historic resources on the border of the village and the East Village south of Union Square. This is an area with nearly 200 19th and early 20th century buildings, many of which were home to key figures and events of the 19th century commerce and 20th century art movements, almost none of which have landmark designation. 
there have been an increasing number of demolitions and unsympathetic alterations in the area, fueled in part by the tech boom extending south of 14th Street. That pressure will be vastly increased by the City Council's recent approval of a commercial upzoning for a tech hub directly adjacent to this area on the south side of 14th Street. The San Denis Hotel at 799 Broadway and built uh, at, and built in 1853, is the most recent casualty, having been demolished in just the last several months. In response to this increasing pressure, village preservation and thousands of neighborhood residents called for zoning or landmarks protections for these a this area to mitigate against the increasing pressure for demolition. And while certainly we feel that the seven proposed buildings would make strong contributions to a more expansive historic district and support their designations as individual landmarks, we question the approach of cherry picking seven buildings, none of which are threatened or likely could be threatened due to their size, while many other worthy buildings in the surrounding area remain protected and vulnerable. All seven structures are historically, architecturally, and culturally significant and thus worthy of designation. They are all stunning and intact examples of their respective styles and their histories are interwoven with the development of the area and are indeed valuable parts of New York City's history and cityscape. But they are only a sampling of such buildings in this area and considered in isolation, the context of which they are a part is missed. This is a context which is rich in both cultural history and architecture that is being lost as we speak. This approach of selecting only these seven, especially as part of a deal to approve an upzoning, which so increases pressure on this area, is highly flawed and results in the destruction of more New York City's, more of New York City's support history than its preservation. We urge the city to consider a much broader view for this area and particularly of those buildings which, unlike these, are currently endangered or potentially endangered. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Adams and Council Member Barron. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy is pleased to support designation of 826 Broadway and all of the landmarks before you today. We issued statements of support for each of them at LPC hearings, but as there's been a great deal of public misinformation regarding 826 Broadway, it's the focus of this testimony. 826 Broadway is a, one of a group of seven distinguished buildings you're hearing today along Broadway that will represent the history and architecture of Manhattan just south of Union Square. 826, like the others, clearly merits designation for its design and construction. This building features intact Renaissance revival facades of limestone and brick with rich terracotta details. Architect William Berkmeyer, who was known for his writings on early skeleton frame construction, exemplified that style in this 1902 structure. The owner of 826 Broadway and the Strand Bookstore, which occupies the building's lower floors, has made many claims about the ill effects she anticipates for the Strand with designation. We'd like to respond to a few of them which have been posted on the store's website. The website noted that over the last 70 years, the number of bookstores in New York City has fallen dramatically, that Amazon poses a particular threat, and that designation would be another blow. And this is certainly a, a time of a volatile, volatile retail environment, but there's little evidence that designation leads to these closures. Concerns were raised that the burdens of designation would prevent the owner from making improvements to the facade, reconfiguring the interior, adding a coffee shop, or dealing with disasters. The Landmarks Commission routinely approves such items as lighting, signage, and awnings. It doesn't regulate changes to the interior. A coffee shop would require permits from multiple agencies, and the Commission has been quick to respond to disasters such as fires, floods, and hurricanes. And as we said in the past, the Conservancy offers to help the owner if any issues arise. Designation doesn't preserve buildings in amber. For over a century, 826 Broadway has evolved as needed. It will continue to do so, but now under the guidance of the Landmarks Commission. We believe that designation will preserve not only the buildings of this neighborhood, but its dynamic character and vibrant quality of life. The Strand, 826 Broadway, is a landmark in the hearts and minds of New Yorkers, tourists, and book lovers everywhere. But without landmarking, its home is as unprotected as Rizzoli on West 57th Street was before that building was demolished. And we would all feel the loss if it were to suffer the same fate. So we urge you to affirm this designation. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Council Members, Simeon Bank Off Historic Districts Council. HDC is firmly in favor of the designation of these seven buildings, although we share our colleagues' concern that we're missing the forest for the trees with this particular uh, tranche of designations, that it's uh, sort of sad after we were just talking about the importance of the cultural history of the LGBT community to not really focus on the important cultural histories of the labor movement that really was very evident in the buildings on Broadway between Union Square, not called Union Square because it was the first Labor Day parade, but because it was the Union of Streets, yet it was still the first Labor Day parade. Uh, between uh, 14th Street and Broadway between 14th and 8th Avenue, which was really part of the Ladies' Mile and a major manufacturing hub for people in the Garment Center, and there was a lot of activity going on there. We also share our colleagues at the Lambert's Conservancy's concerns and uh, rebuttals to the information that had been promulgated by the Strand owners. Um, we have seen landmark properties throughout the city uh, businesses in landmark properties throughout the city prosper and continue on despite and in fact sometimes even perhaps because of designation. Similarly, we have seen long-time businesses in landmark properties and outside of landmark properties fail, that the two things are not really connected. The Landmarks Preservation Commission is very good about working with owners in cases of emergency, in cases of re standard renovation, and uh, they do not regulate interior uses. Finally, as our colleagues at the Conservancy mentioned, if there are concerns about changing uses, putting in a cafe or something like that, that I would not hesitate to say it's much more difficult to get new cafe licenses than get a new door from the LPC. Thank you. Thank you again for your testimony today. We appreciate it. Okay, once again, are, they, are there any more members of the public who wish to testify on these items? Seeing none, the public hearings on LUs 481, 482, 483, 484, 485, 486, and 487 are now closed. And as the vote to approve the preconsidered LU related to a new school siting, council, Councilmember Barron, how do you vote on the uh, pre-considered item 2019-5068 SCQ? With four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the vote is held open. Okay, the vote is held open. Our third set of historic landmark designations consists of two individual landmarks. LU-488 is the designation by the Landmarks Preservation Commission of the National Society of Colonial Dames in the state of New York headquarters, located at 215 East 71st Street, a.k.a. 215 through 217 East 71st Street, Block 1426, Lot 10 in Manhattan, as a historic landmark. This site is located in Councilmember Powers District. LU-489 is the designation of the First Hungarian Reformed Church located at 346 East 69th Street, a.k.a. 346 through 348 East 69th Street, Block 14243, Lot 37 in Manhattan as a historic landmark. This designation in, is in Councilmember Kalos' district. And I will now read the letter from Council Member Kalos into the record. Letter in support of the designation as an individual landmark, First Hungarian Reformed Church, AKA 346, through 348 East 69th Street. Since the request for evaluation submission on August 6, 2013, Friends of the Upper East Side has supported the designation of the First Hungarian Reformed Church as an individual landmark, both as the representative of City Council District, where the structure lies, and as the grandson of Hungarian immigrants who was raised in Yorkville. I treasure the physical markers of Yorkville's unique history. Along with Friends, I would like to formally support the, propose for, the proposal for designation of this church as an individual landmark. Landmark. Because it is a rare example of the Hungarian vernacular in New York City and is associated with the story of the Hungarian immigrant community in Yorkville, the first Hungarian Reform Reformed Church was listed on the National Register of Historic Places on August 31, 2000. 
Moreover, this church was and remains a cultural gathering spot and place of familiarity for the Hungarian community. The, the vernacular style and detailed craftsmanship of the first Hungarian Reformed Church make it a unique architectural structure and it should be protected as a symbol of Yorkville's ethnic history. It is vital that structures like this church, with, which physically mark the relationship of Yorkville to its history as an enclave for European immigrants, be landmarked to preserve this cultural history. This church was and remains a cultural gathering spot and place of familiarity for the Hungarian community, designated by prominent Hungarian architect Emery Roth in the Hungarian vernacular style. The church is a symbol of the Hungarian community and their efforts to their homeland. And their efforts to establish a reform congregation in the city free from the religious <laughs> persecution they faced in their homeland. It is instilled a sense of pride in their culture while also providing a sense of security for the Hungarian immigrant community. That history is my family's history. My grandparents came to New York City in the wake of the Christian Al Christian Opt prior to the start of World War II, joining the existing community of Hungarians, moving to an apartment on East 71st Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues with a ground floor dermatology practice. By 1940, New York City had the largest Hungarian community in America with a population of about 123,000. The first Hungarian church designed in the Hungarian vernacular and secessionist style became a cultural enclave for the Hungarian community. The church recalls churches located in small Central European villages, thus creating a little Hungary within Yorkville. Moreover, this provided and still provides a sense of security, giving immigrants like my family a sense of place within their new country. This is the neighborhood I grew up in, which had so many cultural touchstones from restaurants to bakeries and cultural institutions, many of which have since been displaced. That is why I cherish any buildings that connect us to our past and stand in living testimony to the rich cultural immig immigrant heritage of the area that might otherwise be denied. As a child, I walked past the First Hungarian Reformed Church every day on my way to yeshiva as Rabbi Arthur Schneier Park East Day School. The church continues to this day as a part of a waning group of religious institutions devoted to and with services in their mother tongue, connecting us to that immigrant heritage we share. It continues to serve the Hungarian community and the neighborhood at large, frequently hosting block association cooperative and condominium meetings. For all these reasons, I am proud to support the designation of the First Hungarian Reformed Church as an individual landmark and ask my colleagues to vote in favor. It is signed sincerely, Benjamin K. Lopes, Council Member, 5th District. I hereby open the public hearings on LUs 488 and 489 and again invite our LPC representatives to present their testimony on these designations. Anthony and Kate. And once again, please restate your names for the record and I remind you that you're still under oath. Thank you, Chair Adams. I'm Kate Lemus McHale. Anthony Fabre. Okay, just make sure the microphone is on, that the red light is on, and you may begin. Yes. The National Society of Colonial Dames in the state of New York headquarters was designed in 1929 by the noted architect Richard Henry Dana, Jr., and is exceptionally intact example of the Georgian Revival style. The building is located on East 71st Street in Yorkville. At the public hearing on May 21st, 2019, three people spoke in favor of designation, including representatives of the National Society of Colonial Dames in the state of New York, the Historic Districts Council, and the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. The commission also received written submissions in support of designation from Council Member Keith Powers, Manhattan Community Board 8, New York Landmarks Conservancy, and an individual. In the last quarter of the 19th century, celebration of the centennials of the Declaration of Independence and George Washington's inauguration resulted in a renewed interest in the history of the colonial era. Around the same time, the colonial revival style of architecture was gaining popularity across the country as architects referred to the styles of the colonial era in new civic, institutional, and residential buildings. The National Society of the Colonial Dames of America was established in 1891 along with other similar groups, to preserve and promote, promote colonial era history. In 1893, the New York Society was founded, offering lectures, a library of genealogy and history, working with the growing immigrant community, 
um, to offer classes in English, American history, and the naturalization process, and managing the Van Cortland Mansion built in 1750 and shown here on the right. In 1927, the members of the New York Society approved a plan to construct a new headquarters to showcase their mission and to enable students and non-members to use the library. They hired Richard Henry Dana, Jr., a respected architect and expert in the architecture of the colonial period to design the building. He had, his initial design was directly inspired uh, by the building pointed out on the left, which is the J Colonel John McEver House, formerly on Wall Street uh, from the 18th century. In 1929, the organization purchased property on East 71st Street. Dana adapted his design to more efficiently fit a 40-foot wide lot, ultimately using as design inspiration elements from nine colonial era houses along the um, New England coast and melding them into a cohesive Georgian revival design. The Headquarters Museum House, as it is currently called, is operated as a house museum showcasing colonial revival architecture and artifacts um, with classroom and event space and a library. Beautifully maintained since its completion in 1930, the National Society of Colonial Dames in the state of New York headquarters is a remarkably intact example of an idealized Georgian revival style mansion. Its design melds architectural elements drawn from colonial era structures into a cohesive design adapted to the site and expressing the mission of the Colonial Dames organization. The First Hungarian Reformed Church of New York, located on East 69th Street in Yorkville, is a striking example of early 20th century church architecture, incorporating both secessionist and arts and crafts details into a sophisticated design. It's one of a small number of religious properties designed by the distinguished New York City architect Emery Roth, and is significant for its association with the Hungarian-American community who settled in the Yorkville neighborhood. The landmark site is shown here on the south side of East 69th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues. At the March 26, uh, 2019 public hearing, five people testified in favor of the designation, including New York City Council Member Benjamin Kalos, representatives of the Historic Districts Council, the New York Metro Chapter of the Victorian Society in America, Friends of the Upper East Side, and two individuals. A letter from Community Board 8 supporting the designation was also read. No one spoke in opposition. Letters of support were also received from the 69th Street Block Association and 10 individuals, including two of Emery Roth's grandchildren. This Hungarian reform congregation dates to 1895 and was originally located in the East Village. In 1914, the congregation made plans to build a church in Yorkville where a large number of Hungarian, German, Czech, and Slovak immigrants settled in the first half of the 20th century. Yorkville was the location of breweries and factories along the East River providing jobs for immigrant families, and many Hungarian businesses such as bookstores, bakeries, butcher shops, and restaurants were located within a few blocks of the church in Little Hungary. To design the new church, the congregation commissioned Emery Roth, one of New York City's most important and prolific 20th century architects, who was born in 1871 in Austria-Hungary in present-day Slovakia, and um, many of his buildings are New York City landmarks including iconic apartment houses on Central Park West. And this is a rare example of church design by the architect early in his career. And as Councilmember Kalos noted in his letter, um, the design for this building does meld arts and crafts and secessionist stylistic features and also um, draws from more traditional um, uh, vernacular from Eastern Europe. Um, and so this is a very interesting sort of combination of the architectural design, the architect, the um, congregation that it was designed for, all coming together in this expression of the building. Um, and uh, the visually striking church continues to serve the same congregation that built it more than 100 years ago and looks much as it did when it was constructed in 1915. With its distinctive design, the first Hungarian Reformed Church is a significant religious structure designed by Roth and is an exceptional cultural and architectural reminder of the early 20th century Hungarian-American community in Yorkville. Thank you, I'm happy to take any questions. I have no questions on these applications. Councilmember Barrett, no questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, we'll now call uh, Simeon Bankoff back and 
and Sarah Camelatos. Keeping you busy today, Simeon. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Camelatos, and I'm the Preservation Associate at Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. I'm here today to voice our enthusiastic support for the designation of both the National Society of Colonial Dames Headquarters and the First Hungarian Reformed Church. Um, I'll speak first on the um, National Society of Colonial Dames Headquarters, um, which is a fine example of elements that define the colonial revival style favored by clubs and upscale private homes through the late 19th and early 20th century in Manhattan amid a renewed interest in the colonial period, sparked at first by widespread centennial celebrations of the United States founding. Founded in 1891, the society has since been dedicated to protecting and promoting tangible colonial heritage through historic preservation, patriotic service, and social and educational work. The members of the National Society of Colonial Dames were among the early proponents of historic preservation, and indeed the House is a testament to their commitment to honoring and highlighting the notable legacy of New York State's colonial era through this architecture. The Society commissioned Richard Henry Dana IV, uh, an architect noted for his excellence in the colonial revival architecture in New York and New England. Um, Dana sought to design a new building that would emphasize another age and in a modern setting evocative of the dignified and charming way in which our forebears lived. An effort was made to incorporate details from colonial era buildings el elsewhere in New York State, reflecting the focus of the New York chapter of the society. Each of the design elements were chosen deliberately to echo the appearance of notable pre-revolutionary sites. An announcement from November 1930 in the New York Times spoke of the dame's new home typical of pre-revolution days that was to house relics, furniture, and paintings um, of 18th century New York. The plum-colored bricks recalls the Schuyler Mansion in Albany and the door and fanlight were inspired by the Phillips Manor in Yonkers, which was constructed by um, Jacobus Van Cortland and Eva Phillips, whose son Frederick built the Van Cortland Mansion that was later purchased by the Colonial Dames for use as a museum. Additionally, the fifth floor dormers were adapted from the typical scale and appearance of 18th century New England homes. These evocative elements coalesce on the facade and the building stands as an amalgam of sorts of the colonial style, of which there are few examples remaining in New York City. These inspirations were seamlessly merged to create a primary facade that definitely recreated and exemplified the colonial past through a revivalist architecture. The building has been meticulously maintained and continues to serve the community as a house museum and popular location for educational tours, and it's still in use as the Colonial Dames primary clubhouse and event space. The group has been an exemplary steward of 215 E71st Street, which has not been altered significantly since construction. Uh, the facade pays homage to the colonial history of New York State, a history that the Society of Colonial Dames has been committed to preserving since its inception, and this commendable stewardship uh, deserves to be supported by local designation. And um, regarding uh, the First Hungarian Reformed Church, um, it's an enduring brick and mortar representation of the strength of Yorkville's long standing Hungarian community, and as Hungarian American architect Emery Roth's ode to the building styles of the homeland he shared with this congregation. The church, which is Emery Roth's only Christian ecclesiastical building, is a striking example of the 20th century vernacular church design and was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in the year 2000. The building's primary facade recalls the appearance of traditional Christian buildings throughout Central Europe, along with geometric secessionist details, definitely included by Roth to create a design relevant within its early 20th century context. Additionally, the church's tower houses the bell from the congregation's former building on East 7th Street, which speaks to the rich history and continuity of the church's parish in New York City. The First Hungarian Reformed Church is part of an array of mid-block religious structures that serve various immigrant communities within Yorkville. As these communities have long been dwindling, designation would help to preserve this clear visual representation of this neighborhood's unique past and to protect from looming development pressures. The church has withstood the past century as a highly intact and rare extant reminder of the neighborhood's Hungarian legacy, all while actively serving the community and spiritual needs of its dedicated congregation. And we hope that surviving buildings, other surviving buildings that represented the rich immigrant history of Yorkville continued to be recognized and protected. Thanks so much for your time. Good afternoon, council members, Simeon Bankoff, Historic Districts Council. Um, we are in strong support for both of these. I cannot possibly equal uh, council member Kalos's impassioned letter about the church, which is a remarkable building. I can only add that, um, as Sarah had mentioned, this is one of only five Emory Roth religious buildings. It's his only Christian one. He was a Jew, uh, which I think kind of speaks a lot about New York City and, and how we all kind of 
work in each other's play, play pens and work well. With regards to the uh, Society for Colonial Dames, I'm not going to be a preservation nerd about this, though I easily could be. The society um, was one of the sort of exemplars and forebears of the historic preservation. The Van Cortlandt Mansion Museum, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Van Cortlandt House Museum is the fourth oldest house museum in the country. Uh, when it was chartered, and the dames have always been uh, looking forward and, and kind of pushing forward the or the notions of the tenets of historic preservation um, through our own origin story, through the house museums. I will also just end up quoting supposedly when the uh, when the dames when it opened in a testament to its faithful interpretation of colonial styles. One of the most qu asked questions when the headquarters opened in 1930 was reportedly, would you mind telling me exactly when this house was built? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you both very much for being here and all of your testimony today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public wishing to testify on any of these items? Seeing none, the public hearings on LUs 488 and 489 are now closed. Finally, our last two items today are two applications submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. First, we will hear the pre-considered LU relating to Bronx Point, application number N190501HAX, submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law of New York State, for approval of the de designation of an urban development action area for property located at block 2356 lots two and 72 block 2539 lot one and part of lots two and three and a demapped de portion of e East 150th Street in the Bronx and approval of an urban development action area project for such area. The proposed action would facilitate a new publicly accessible open space along the Harlem River waterfront as part of a new mixed-use development that would include approximately 1,044 units of affordable housing, ground floor retail space, a cinema, office space, and community facility space. The project is located in Council Member Ayala's district. We are joined today by HPD representatives Lacey Tauber, and other representatives, Charles Samber from NYC EDC, Josu Sanchez, Bronx Point owner, LLC, and Ann Tishwell, Bronx Point owners, LLC. No, no, I have it here, sorry. Before you begin, council will swear you in. Please raise your right hands. Please state your names. Charlie Samboy. Ann Tershwell. Jose Sanchez. Lacey Tauber. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in an answer to all council member questions? I do. Yes. yes. You may begin. Um, good morning uh, to the subcommittee, Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses, and Chair Adams, as well as Council Member Barron. Um, my name is Charlie Samboy, and I am Vice President with the Government Relations Department at NYC EDC. I'm excited to bring the Bronx Point project before the City Council again today, this time in the context of its UDAP request, which is one of the major, one of the many agency approvals this project is seeking as part of the um, development process. 
Um, the project was originally received ULERP approval in October of 2017, which included a rezoning of the site and site disposition, among others. Later that year, the project was also approved by the Bronx Borough Board for a 384 disposition to the Bronx Point development team. Uh, by way of background, in 2016, the New York City Economic Development Corporation issued a lower concourse north request for expressions of interest, or otherwise known as RFEI, to develop the site known as the Lower Concourse North, uh, a site bounded by the demapped um, 150th Street to the north, Exterior Street to the east, and East 149th Street to the south, and the Harlem River to the west, um, adjacent to the 145th Street Bridge in the Bronx. Uh, the spirit of the RFEI sought to provide the opportunity to achieve multi-community and city policy goals while catalyzing development in the general Lower Concourse area. The intention of the project is to facilitate a mixed-use, transit-oriented development that provides substantial affordable units for residents with a wide range of incomes, provides publicly accessible open space to all local residents and visitors, expands open space access to, adjacent, to the adjacent Mill Pond Park, and creates the opportunity for a variety of community uses serving local and potentially regional needs as well, um, and ultimately creates the opportunity for cultural and community facilities to serve Bronx Community Board 4 and Community District 1 uh, residents as well as those from the broader Bronx and New York City. In 2017, NYC EDC and HPD selected a development project known as Bronx Point, a joint venture between LM Development Partners and Type A projects, which are represented here today. Um, the ULERP and 384B4 approvals for this project were subsequently approved, as I said, in October and December of 2017, respectively. Um, the JV will speak to the broader project, um, but the approval we are seeking from this subcommittee and from the Land Use Committee is what we will be presenting today, which is um, the open space improvements associated with the mixed use project designed by Marvel Architect. These open space improvements will be funded in part through city funds, uh, which is what the UDAP uh, approval um, we are seeking today is for, uh, which HPD will cover in a, in a moment. Um, Phase two of this development, which is included in the UDAP, but all of the open spaces will be delivered as part of phase one. Uh, we are very excited about this proposal and we look forward to presenting it to you today and we'll take questions uh, at the end of our presentations. Uh, before I turn it over to HPD, I would like to briefly discuss some planned investments in the area and the recent history leading up to this development proposal. All of these uh, investments will complement the mixed use development project. As part of the ULERP in 2017, the Special Harlem River Waterfront District was originally approved, which was originally approved in 2009, was expanded to include the Bronx Point site, uh, was expanded to include the Bronx Point site. This facilitated a waterfront access plan to be implemented into the design of this project, which coupled with the zoning district's expansion and the Bronx Point project was a capital investment of nearly $200 million to reconstruct key intersections along Exterior Street, update water and sewer lines, update the streetscape, and install commercial broadband access. Um, all of these capital investments, with the exception of the open space, which we will be discussing today, will be done by the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, funds to reimburse the redevelopment. The development team for costs associated with the open space will be derived from this $200 million investment. Uh, infrastructure work along these key intersections are in the final design phase phases, and we expect construction to begin in 2020 in close coordination with the development team as part of their development process. Uh, together, all these investments comprise what we're calling the Lower Concourse Infrastructure Investment Strategy of nearly $200 million, which complement, as I said, the work of the Bronx Point Mixed Use Project. We believe these investments working in concert have the opportunity to strengthen the South Bronx and provides opportunities for supporting new affordable housing, creating jobs, and bringing new open spaces to the Harlem River. Um, my colleague and now at HPD, Lacey Tauber, will say a few words uh, as further introduction to the UDAP application. Thank you. Hi, council members. Um, I have uh, some testimony that I submitted in writing, but I think a lot of it is kind of repetitive from what Charlie just went over and also what you're gonna hear from the team. So 
I just want to add um, a couple things to what he just said. Um, you know, he mentioned that um, this project was previously approved. Um, you know, what we're doing today is expanding the area that qualifies as a UDAP or an urban development action area, as um, that allows us to um, route some of the investment funding that Charlie was mentioning uh, to this project for the open space improvements. Um, HPD's role here also has to do with the housing, and I would just mention that um, the Phase One building has approximately 400, uh, sorry, 540 units of permanently affordable housing, which utilizes um, HPD's mix and match term sheet. Um, there's a little bit more detail in here, um, but I would let the development team, I think, just run you through um, their plan. Members. Sorry, turn it off. Sorry. Good afternoon, council members. So we're really excited to be here to discuss the Bronx Point project. Um, so as Lacey was mentioning, um, the Bronx Point project is is is, uh, is an exciting project uh, at the at the at the uh, next to the Harlem River. Um, it's a gateway site into the Bronx. You have 145th Street Bridge from Manhattan, and so it's a really uh, it's, a, it's a project that will catapult um, waterfront development um, along the Harlem River. As Lacey mentioned, uh, the, the the project in its totality has a little over a uh, thousand units, 1,045 units across two phases. Phase one, which would include all of the open space includes approximately 540 units of permanently affordable housing. Um, the, uh, there's uh, over 2.8 acres of uh, open space, which would all be included as part of phase one. Uh, a, a big portion of that is, is, a, is a new playground for the community, which uh, my colleague Annie will, will, will dive into. Um, in the building includes, aside from the, from the housing, we have over 57,000 square feet of educational and community facility space. Um, we have our, our community partner, Bronx Works, which has been doing work in the area for over 40 years. Uh, there will be providing supportive services for, for formerly homeless uh, households in the in the project, uh, city science and Billion Oyster project will provide educational programming um, for the for the for for, for people and, and kids in, in in the project and the vicinity as well. And our community facility space is is, is anchored uh, by a permanent home for the Universal Hip Hop Museum, um, which will celebrate hip hop culture across uh, uh, many exciting and engaging exhibits. Um, on the commercial side, we have over 70,000 square feet of engaging retail uh, anchored by a, a new state-of-the-art movie theater. Uh, uh, it's going to have uh, 10 screens, slated to have 10 screens at the moment. Um, and so we're really excited to bring in uh, this use in, in the Bronx, uh, which has lacked uh, or is underserved uh, for movie theaters. Um, next slide. Um, here, we're just going to... Uh, here's an aerial view of the project. As I mentioned, it, it's along the Harlem River waterfront, which doesn't have or has a lack of, of residential uh, uh, developments over the years. And so this uh, extends the adjacent park to, to build a new playground, a new a waterfront esplanade, along with the building as well. Um, and before I turn it over to my colleague Annie, which will which will dive into the open space areas, uh, just it's it's uh, important to know that this has been a collaborative effort with the the local community, and particularly Community Board Four. Um, we've had over 20 sessions dating to now nearly two years of engagement with the local community. Uh, we have another one coming up in about a week or so. And so uh, uh, the, the, the plans that you see here were in close uh, collaboration with the community who provided a key uh, input to the open space design. Um, testified today, thank you. Um, so I wanted to just very briefly walk you through, I think what Josue had mentioned was a very exciting um, community-driven design process. Um, first and foremost, we wanted to make sure that the siting of the building um, allowed for seamless integration of new open space with the existing park um, and uh, incorporate the um, creation of a new waterfront esplanade. One thing that we'd heard from community, from the community is that a lot of um, new developments, the open space around it always felt like it was for the new buildings and not for the community at large. And so when we were um, creating the siting of the project, we created both visual and pedestrian access through the site 
to the water and to the open space. Um, that was a really critical component for us. Um, we also didn't, even though zoning allowed us to, we didn't want to create a wall of building between the community and the open space on the waterfront. So we created a rather porous um, site plan. You'll see that there is a new roadway being constructed. We tried to, well, we pulled that as far away from the existing open space as we can by setting it um, as a cul-de-sac road in between phase one and the future uh, phase two. Um, so the elements of the open space really did come out of this 20 plus um, meetings with the community. There were a number of elements that were really first and foremost in the community's um, mind for what they wanted to see. A large playground for multi-ages um, is um, really at the heart of what uh, our plan shows. And you can see that sort of large beige areas right in the middle. Um, if you've ever gone there on a summer weekend, you know that the barbecues are very um, well attended. So we have expanded the barbecue area. We've also created adult fitness areas um, and created a tremendous amount of shaded um, viewing to the waterfront. Um, uh, one of the things that the community also wanted was um, uh, enhanced lighting and safety, and we accommodated that in our plan as well. The last thing I'll mention is that they wanted, uh, community really wanted an open area for dancing and for yoga classes, and so we incorporated that into the plan. Um, I would say the one other piece that we spent a bunch of time on are, uh, was around sustainability. So the existing site is at uh, an elevation of plus six. We're bringing the full open space up about five feet to an elevation of plus 11, and even berming the playground um, in areas to uh, plus 15, so that we're creating um, a sustainable waterfront and also buffering some of the improvements from potential water impact. Um, this is just really to show you that the sort of striped space is the uh, developer maintained space and the purple and orange uh, solid spaces is all of the open space um, to be maintained by the Department of Parks and Recreation. I think it's important to note that as part of the development agreement, um, the developer, the development team is um, giving money into a fund to help maintain the open space. So now some, some pretty pictures. Um, the, um, the building itself integrates uh, a very large uh, stairwell, uh, stairway, um, I guess not a stairway, it's stair, um, into the design. As you probably know, there is a train track right adjacent to the site and right um, the first thing you sort of note when you look at the waterfront. So it was the design team and the development team's intention to bring people up above um, the level of the train tracks and really um, enjoy the bucolic nature of the Harlem River. We did that by incorporating this ADA compliance stair that we work with the mayor's office on. You'll see that on the first and uh, second floors of the building is a hip hop museum. Josue spoke about facing the water. We have all of our community facility space and the um, bridge like element um, is, uh, is emergency egress for the, um, the museum, uh, movie theater. Again, another view towards both the museum um, and the open space, and then you'll see that we are creating a plaza as well as part of the development project uh, along exterior street to engage the community and bring them across the river uh, and up to the waterfront and the open space. Um, this is that plaza that's part of our development site. Um, again, really setting the stage for what we hope is a gateway to the waterfront and new open space the much wanted open space for salsa dancing. Um, the Esplanade is a, obviously a very critical component of this project. It extends the waterfront access already existing in Mill Palm Park, and we hope that it will continue down the waterfront to the south, as does the community on future developments. Um, one thing, um, as we mentioned, really desired by the community is a multi-age playground. I would, it's a, it's a lovely playground, we think. Um, the community was very excited about it. There are two elements that they wanted in particular, one which is uh, water features, and on the bottom right is a piece of equipment um, designed for children um, facing challenges of autism, creates a sort of cozy dome, so we really tried to um, incorporate multiple um, pieces of play equipment for the whole community. The, um, these towers that are these play structures are also ADA accessible, so they have ramps which allow for uh, children in wheelchairs to access a, that equipment as well. 
Um, this is um, just a, a lighting plan which shows that we have and um, dramatically um, enhanced sight lighting as is appropriate. They will meet all EGC um, dark sky requirements for the podium and for um, the plaza open space. I think that, one more, sorry. Um, and again, this just shows you that um, we, we took um, the site's 12-month, 24-hour um, presence very seriously and wanted to make sure that the site felt exciting and safe and engaging. And we hope that we um, did that at, in the evening hours as well with a dynamic lighting plan. So that is the end of our presentation. Thank you. A more formal way to end it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a very um, exciting, extraordinary project. And I, I, I'm still amazed. I've seen the presentation before, but it still amazes me to see all, all of the items put in place um, for this community. I'm excited uh, for the community to have this, um, this amazing museum. And I, I mentioned um, that, you know, think about Queens a little bit when it comes to. Yeah. You know, um, along those lines, you know, with these projects come amazing um, and extraordinary opportunities also um, for workers. So I just wanted to touch a little bit on um, what we are putting in place uh, for workers on the project and what wage and benefit rates uh, like health and retirement are currently included in HPD's underwriting for the building service jobs at the site. I would say um, for the building service, that's something that Councilmember Ayala brought to our attention. Something that um, we're looking into right now. I don't have. I can get back to you on the on the details there. So along those same lines, is there any kind of commitment then? Since my colleague did bring that up to you uh, before, is there any kind of commitment um, uh, that the team has come up with to ensuring? Um, Again, I would say you know. Ev Everything is a trade-off in terms of our financing, so it's something we have our development folks looking into to see what's possible. Okay, we'll follow up with that. It's, it's very important. All right, I don't have any other questions on this application, Councilmember Barron. Thank you very much for being here and for your presentation. And I have some questions, just a few. What's the height? of this building that you're proposing? This is phase one, I said, that you said? What's the height? Yes, the, the height of the building is uh, 260 feet. Um, there's a little more feet when, for uh, mechanical spaces, but uh, we're, we're topped out zoning at 260 feet. And what, how many stories is that, considering? It, the, the building is 23 stories. 23 stories. And what's the FAR? The FAR. The, I'm sorry. Oh, the FAR. The FAR. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. <laughs> I think I forgot. I think it's like I'm not six. Sure we have that yeah, I don't. I don't think I have that information. But the the building itself is about 585,000 square feet. Um, it's it's zoning compliant. Um, but yeah, that's the gross square feet of the building. Okay. Um, the, the, so as my notes here, the the zoning allows for, is capped at 4.6 FAR. I didn't hear you. 4.6 FAR. Thank you. So I think I read in your, uh, someplace in your literature that the apartments are designed for AMIs from, I think it said starting at 30%? Yeah, 30 to 130% of the AMI. There's Targeted also. incomes will range from 30 to 130% of the AMI. That's correct, and then there's also uh, uh, some units set aside for the formerly homeless as well. I didn't but hear you. There's some um, units set aside for the formerly homeless, and then the, the lottery units uh, range from 30 to 130, that's correct. So you have some set asides for right. formerly homeless. Do we have the income bands? So there was actually a points of agreement that uh, the city entered into with the council member at the time in 2017 that outlines um, pretty specific income bands in that range, um, matching our mix and match term sheet at the time. 
Um, as you may be aware, we have made some tweaks to our term sheets in the last couple of years. So one thing that we're actually looking into is if there's a possibility to bring some of the units down at the higher end, which might um, you know, require making some changes in the middle. Uh, but that's a conversation I think you know, we want to have with the council member who represents this area um, as we move forward. Um, but I would say just generally we're still committed to using the mix and match term sheet which provides for that range of incomes. My concern is always the degree to which these so-called um, affordable housing projects in fact displace people who live in the community or create situations for people who presently live in the community to eventually be priced out as these uh, rentals come in at 130% of the AMI. 130% is middle income. 130% AMI is people making $122,000, basically, for a family of three. So do we have any idea of what the income bands presently are in the community where this housing is proposed? I mean, I don't have that information in front of me right now. Um, I would say, you know, we know it's on the lower end. Um, I would also add, you know, again, that there was a POA that um, was signed a couple years ago that outlined, you know, a, a range and, you know, we're committed to working uh, to match that or come close to it to the extent that we're able with our new term sheet. Um, the only thing I'll add, I think, and we can submit this um, as part of follow-up, um, there was a letter that the community board sent to us as part of the Euler process which outlined their desire to see a mix of incomes, which included some at the higher end, but obviously addressing affordability levels at the lower spectrum. Um, but we did hear quite surprisingly from the community board and others that they wanted to see a mix that included both low, moderate, and, 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 and units at the higher end. That's uh, interesting, and I'd love to see what, what they propose to be the proportions uh, or the percentages across the income bands that will be designed for this project. And do we have any idea of the number of units or the mix of units? Are there going to be studios, one, two, three bedrooms? Do we have that information? That's actually in my testimony. Sorry, I skipped over it, but I do have it here. Um, so for the first phase, which is the one that for which the planning work is, is done, it's 135 studios, uh, 192 one bedrooms, 122 two bedrooms, and 93 three bedrooms. And did you say studios? I did, 135. 135. And you know my next question with the studios. <laughs> how, how big are the studios? Right. I'll turn it over to them for that. I mean, <laughs> uh, they, they range, but they're all in compliance with HPD design guidelines. So we've, we followed that. Uh, I think we're towards the higher end of, of that range, but um, where we've been following the HPD design guidelines to, to design the the units. Um, this is an MIH project, and HPD, of course, will be reviewing our plants to make sure they're compliant. Okay, so I, I would like to know also how we're matching up these different size units with the income bands to make sure that uh, they're not all, those lower units, the smaller units are not concentrated at the lower AMIs. But I'm always concerned about how these so-called affordable projects go up to 130% uh, of the AMI, which according to ANDH um, is about, I don't have the exact, oh, 5% of the population of New York City, according to ANHD, is about, no, I'm sorry, 130, they have 3% of New York City's population is presently at 130% AMI. So when we talk about bringing in a large percentage of project apartments within a project at 130% of A and I, AM, of the AMI, which ANHD says represents 3% of the population, I'm concerned. I, can, it's can, a beautiful can, project, can, it's wonderful, the amenities and all of that, uh, but who are we actually sure. preparing these projects I, for? I, I would just like to mention, we, we are following the mix and match term sheet. 60% of the apartments are at tax credit eligible uh, rents and incomes, meaning 80% AMI or below. I, I would like to focus, 10% ten, uh, 10 of the units are at uh, um, f dedicated for the formerly homeless. We also have bands at 30% AMI in addition to the formerly homeless 
and we have another uh, 20% at, uh, I believe it's 47% EMI. So we have a project that 60% of, of, of the units are, are for uh, tax credit eligible units, 80% EMI or below, and we have approximately 40% at extremely low or low in incomes. I would say the, 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 the 100, 130% EMI is a small portion of the building to, to, to have a mixed income community, but, uh, but the, the project has a, a, a lot of, is really targeting a lot of low income uh, um, sectors, in income tiers, which is what the, the mix and match term sheet, uh, 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 the intent of the mix and match term sheet. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member Barron. We have been joined by Council Member Miller and I don't think Councilman Miller has questions for this no. panel. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your testimony today. You. I'm sure that we'll be following up with you. Okay. If there are no members of the public wishing to testify on this item, Seeing none, the public hearings on the pre-considered LU relating to this application number N190501HAX is now closed and as the vote to approve the pre-considered LU related to the new school siting, council. On pre-considered item 2019-5068-SCQ, uh, council member Miller, how do you vote? I vote aye. By a vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and with zero abstentions, the item is approved for referral to the full land use committee. Okay, and that item is now closed. Our last public hearing today will be on the pre-considered LU relating to Brownsville South, application number C190373HAK, submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the designation of property located at 47 New Lots Avenue, Block 3855, Lot 40, 609 through 615 Osborne Street, Block 3628, Lot 9, and 120 through 122 Liberty Avenue, Block 3693, Lots 22 and 23 in the Borough of Brooklyn, and Urban Development Action Area, approval of an urban development area project for such area, and approval of the disposition of such properties to a developer selected by HPD to facilitate the con construction of three residential developments containing approximately 41 affordable dwelling units and commercial space. This project is located in districts represented by Council Members Barron and Espinal. Council Member Barron, do you have any remarks to share? Thank you, Madam Chair. We met last week and there were some concerns that I voiced at that time so I'm willing to be eager to hear what it is that is being presented. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are once again joined by members of HPD, Lacey Tauber and Michael McCartney. Mr. McCartney, we have to swear you in. Please raise your right hand and state your name. Do you affirm you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and in answer all subcommittee uh, and our council member questions? One sec, let me make sure you all have copies of the presentation. Thank you. You may begin when you're ready. Okay. Um, this, um, this pre-considered land use item is related to ULERP application number C190373HAK that seeks UDAP designation project disposition, oh sorry, and project and disposition approval for four city-owned vacant lots located at 120 to 122 Liberty Avenue in Council District 37 and 609 Osborne Street and 47 New Lots Avenue in Council District 42. The project is known as Brownsville South and is slated for development under HPD's Neighborhood Construction Program, NCP, which funds infill rental housing with up to 45 units, affordable to low, moderate, and middle-income households. The development team was chosen through a competitive process and proposes to construct three buildings containing a total of 41 affordable residential units and a superintendent's unit. 
Upon completion, 120 to 122 Liberty Avenue will be a four-story building with two studio units, seven one-bedroom units, three two-bedroom units, and one three-bedroom unit for a total of 13 units. Uh, the building to be located at 47 New Lots Avenue will be a six-story building with five studio units, six one-bedrooms, three two-bedrooms, including the supers unit, and three three-bedroom apartments for a total of 17 units. The building will also contain approximately 2,000 square feet of commercial space on the ground floor. The third building at 609 Osborne Street will be four stories with four studios, five one-bedrooms, and three three-bedroom apartments for a total of 12 units. Of the total unit count, approximately five units, 12% of the total, will be set aside for formerly homeless families and individuals referred from other social service agencies such as the Department of Homeless Services, DHS. The targeted incomes from this project will be from 30 to 80% of the area median income, or AMI. The buildings will be built to um, meet Enterprise Green community standards, and amenities will include laundry room, bike storage, elevator, and recreational rear yard per building. Today, HPD is before the landmark subcommittee seeking approval of the Brownsville South NCP project in order to facilitate construction of these affordable residential buildings. And I would just add that, yes, we, we have met um, with Council Members Barron and Espinal, and we've um, heard their feedback on this project. And you know, we are working to incorporate that feedback to the extent that we are able. Um, these are small buildings. Um, you know, this project or this um, term sheet, I should say, is really designed to, um, you know put affordable housing on some of these smaller, tough to develop lots and take advantage of, you know, economies of scale to do these buildings and clusters. And, you know, so we are working to work with them to the extent that we are able to do so within the constraints of, you know, a small project like this. And I'll turn it over to the development team to give you some more details. Uh, please be sure your mic is on. We have to make sure it gets into the record. Hello? That's there on. There we go. Um, there seems to be a disconnect between this computer and that screen. Is this assist with getting that hooked up? Okay, we're going to see if we can get a technician in to help you. Oh, it's not the mic, it's that we can't, we're having trouble advancing the, uh, the presentation. Not really sure what's going on there. I mean, yeah, yeah we, we can go have through it. these. Um, if we can't get it to work, but it's nice because I think they can, if someone's watching on the feed, they can see it. So maybe we should give it a second. OK. All right, so uh, my name is Michael McCarthy. I represent Alembic Community Development. We are uh, co-developing this project with JMR Residential. And our architect is Urban Quotient. Um, as Lacey went through, uh, we have a, the project is um, on three sites in the Brownsville neighborhood. Um, uh, the first one is 609 Osborne Street. Um, this will be a four-story building with a total of 12 units um, with four studios, five one-bedrooms, and three three-bedroom units. Um, and uh, that, that site will include an elevator, a, a backyard with, for um, passive recreation, a laundry room and bike storage. The second building in the cluster is 47 new lots. Um, this is the largest of the three buildings. It's a six-story building with a total of 17 units, including five studios, six one-bedrooms, three two-bedrooms, including a supers unit for the cluster, three three-bedroom units, and approximately 2,000 square feet of commercial space. Um, like the other buildings, this one will include an elevator, a, um, pa a passive recreation area in the backyard, bike storage, and laundry. 
Um, and the third site is a little further away, up on 120 to 122 Liberty Avenue in um, uh, Council Member Espinel's district. This, pro this building um, is another four-story building with a total of 13 units, including two studios, seven one-bedrooms, three two-bedrooms, and one three-bedroom uh, unit. Uh, as the, like the other two, the amenities include um, laundry, a lot, an elevator, and a passive recreation area in the backyard. Um, the, um, the total uh, proposed unit mix between the four, the three buildings is a total of 11 studios, 18 one-bedrooms, two two-bedrooms, and se or, I'm sorry, six two-bedrooms and seven three-bedrooms for a total of 42 units. Um, in our current underwriting that's under review, um, after our meeting last week with Council Member Barron, um, we currently have about half of the units um, at at above 60% of AMI and half of the units below 60% AMI. Um, so that is one of the things that we are currently looking at um, changing um, based on the feedback that we received from Council Member Barron and Council Member Espinal. Um, and just a, you know, a summary of the project, the, um, it's 100% affordable with a 10% uh, set aside, total of 42 units and three new construction buildings. Um, and uh, each of the, these um, parcels are currently vacant, so they'll um, help to improve uh, those vacant lots in the neighborhoods. Each building has the amenities that I listed. Uh, it will be developed to enterprise green community standards. And um, the current proposal is to include landscaped areas featuring a variety of plant life that will help control stormwater runoff. Uh, we have a commercial space at 47 new lots of about 2,000 square feet for which we are um, open to possibilities of what kind of tenant that would be. Um, we've been um, requesting feedback from the local community board and the council members as to what, um, what, what uh, uses they are interested in seeing there. Um, and finally, the project will be financed uh, with HPD subsidy through the NCP program, uh, along with 9% low-income housing tax credit equity. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will yield to Council Member Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was pleased when this project came to me uh, for consideration. I was concerned about some of the uh, problems or the areas or the aspects of the project. And in terms of the construction, if you've heard me talk about projects in my development, you know I'm always looking for brick and the developers came back and no problem. I was also very pleased at the consideration of the fact that even though this is a small site and only a four-story building, that they were in fact including an elevator, which to me shows respect for the fact that it's an inconvenience to live in a four-story building on the third or fourth floor and have to climb the steps. So that was also, I thought, a very uh, good consideration of the clientele and the residents that would be in the building. The amenities were great as well, laundry room, bike storage, and a very pleasant outdoor sitting space that would be used for residents. The ability to include uh, formerly homeless in some degree within these three projects, also <coughs> a great consideration. The utilization of commercial space being considered by local CBOs and an expansion of their programs, another great consideration. So the sticking point that we have is that 50% of these units, as has been said, is set at uh, above 60% of the AMI. And in Brownsville, 53% of my population has an income of $35,000 or less. And when we go to 60 and 70 and 80%, it's a total of approximately 11% of the population that lives there that fit that income band. That's a problem for me, because to me that's a manifestation or uh, part of what we see as gentrification. When we say affordable, the, the uh, piece that's missing is affordable to whom? 
and we want housing coming in in these areas that have been underdeveloped until recent years, that have been ignored, that have been denied an opportunity of the resources of other more affluent communities. We want them to not now be priced out of living where they have endured hardships for many, many decades. So it's always a concern of mine that there's a closer match between the income levels of the people who are living in the community in a percentage that is closer to what it is that presently live there so that they have an opportunity to be able to apply. It's a small development, these are small developments, but admirable nonetheless, to have an opportunity to be able to apply and realize that uh, their incomes don't disqualify them because they're so low. So that's a sticking point that we have, and it's a major sticking point, but I'm sure that as we get closer that we'll be able to make some modifications, and that's what I look forward to. I think so, and I, we heard you were working on it. We should be able to get back to you soon with Great. something I hope you will like. Um, I will add, as I said before, you know, I hope you understand there's not a lot of room to work with in these small projects, but we'll try to, uh, we'll, we'll do our best to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Councilmember Miller? Good afternoon. Echo the sentiments of my colleagues on how important these projects are, particularly the smaller projects, and know that we are really taking advantage of all the opportunities and not just looking for the larger projects. And, and in the meantime, it is, it is uh, the smaller projects like this that make up the larger demographics of the city and that really change and direct the fabric of, of, of who we are and, and who communities become. So, and, and I'm glad that this conversation and dialogue is happening so that. Um, we make sure that we're protecting the integrities of, of communities as we move forward. And, and, and these particular package of, of projects that we see here, um, how far are we from once we vote on and, and, and shovels in the ground, how, how, when do we plan on, on, on closing and, and moving on these projects? You're asking when the, closing, the anticipated closing date is? I mean, I think that's <laughs> that's something that we hesitate to commit to because uh, you know it can always change as we move the projects forward. Um, they still need to actually apply for the tax credits for this project. That's a competitive process, and you know something that we uh, work with the development teams on. But it's hard for us to say for sure before um, we're even at that phase. Is there any hopes that this would happen this year? Well, the tax credit application actually isn't even uh, due and for, I'm not exactly sure what, a few more weeks. And then, it hasn't so. Been, it hasn't I, been posted I, yet. Yeah, okay. there, no, not this if, year. If, um, if, we had, if, if it worked um, the way that we want it, we would apply for credits this um, coming month. We would get an award later this year, and we would close on construction financing early next year. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Miller. Thank you for your testimony today. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public wishing to testify on this item? Seeing none, the public hearings on the pre-considered LU relating to application number C190373HAK is now closed, and that concludes today's business. The vote on pre-considered LU for application number 20195068SCQ is hereby closed, and all other items on today's agenda are laid over. I would like to thank the members of the public, of course my colleagues, council, and land use staff for attending today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned.